Uh, hello everyone. Um, I don't know why that always surprises me when I click the, to start the video. Um, welcome everyone. Um, this video is going to be me going through um, uh, origins of psychology. Um, this is a weird one. I've, I've got to be honest. This is a weird one for, for many reasons. Um, a lot of students overlook it. Um, many students overlook it. And to be fair, in the spec excuse me that's a burp if i just get the spec up to show you this is what we are looking at today it's not even technically a bullet point um if we go to approaches it sometimes gets missed because bloody hell um because if you have a look everything all of these are bullet points it, so students tend to focus on this but this this one at the top just here it, <laughs> It must be a grammar mistake because everything else has bullet points. This does not have a bullet point. So you do need to know about Wundt. You need to know about introspection and the very basics of emergence of psychology as a science. So if I were to show you questions that have come up here before, let me just see if I can put this overwards. Uh, this is, um, these are all the questions that have come up before. They're pretty much all about Wundt and introspection. So uh, this this one just here, describe Wundt's role in the development of psychology. You've got a lot of, um, got a lot of multiple choice questions, a lot of multiple choice questions actually. But this is the worst question that's come up at the time of recording. Outline and evaluate Wundt's role in the emergence of psychology as a science. I'm hoping by the end of this video, you will be able to answer that. So I'm going to cover Wundt, introspection, as well as the ba very basics of psychology as a science. So let's make a start. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in the second year, we're going to, or towards the end of first year, we're going to look at whether psychology is a science, whether it can be classified as a science. Um, but in order for us to be able to ask that question, we need to understand what a science actually is. And if you do, uh, I'm interested, if you do biology or chemistry or physics or even maths, maybe ask your teacher their opinion about whether they think psychology is a science, because most of them will say no, but most psychology students and most psychology teachers and most universities will say that psychology is a science. So what we are looking at here is essentially, um, I've, I've got a couple of terms which I'm going to skip to now actually, otherwise it's not going to make any sense. When we're looking at psychology being a science, we're looking at it uh, ideally being at least these three things. So it has to be objective, as in it needs to collect non-opinionated data, you know, factual data, for example, psychology doesn't really do that because we are often say oh, on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? That's not scientific because it's not objective. You need to know that for later. It needs to be systematic and it needs to be replicable as well. Systematic in the sense of, you know, you're, you're standardizing your experiments for everyone. You're treating everyone the same, so on and so forth. Replicability, <laughs> ask yourself this. For a science to be a science, it needs to provide replicable data. So it, it, you need to be doing the same test and getting the same or similar results time and time again. Does psychology do that? No, not really, because human behavior is so erratic. So let's. that's what science is. Right, we'll, we'll come through that in a bit more detail. I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at anything before Wundt, but I will spend a little bit of time because um, we need to look at Descartes, we need to look at f philosophy, how psychology was birthed from the cervix of philosophy, um, <clears throat> and it's relatively new. So if you're looking at physics, chemistry, and biology, they're all relatively, uh, relatively old. Psychology is only at the time of filming, roughly speaking, 143 years old whereas biology, chemistry, uh, physics, maths have been going on for millennia. Um, it tends to come from philosophically uh, the 17th to the, the 19th century. That's where the philosophy was. Psychology came from philosophy. Um, but before that, you've got, this, you've got this philosophical idea of Cartesian dualism. So this idea that actually the mind and the the mind and the body are separate. That really, that really is the is a starting point for psychology. Now we'll come to Wundt, and that's the proper starting point for psychology in a second. But if you want to look at the real beginnings of people starting to think psychologically, not philosophically, you need to look at Descartes and his idea of Cartesian 
dualism. So again, it's this idea. Cartesian dualism is is something being two things basically. Dual is is two things. Um, so there's the first idea now of the mind being separate from the body. And as as I say, this is this is pretty much a clear starting point. Apart from that, you've also got John Locke, which we'll look at later on. One thing you do need to know about John Locke, actually, is his belief that we are all tabula razor. This concept that we are all, when we're born, we are all exactly the same. We are a blank slate. And the second that umbilical cord is cut, our experiences start to write upon that. So the, the idea of John Locke and the blank slate, tabula razor, is the idea that actually when we're born, we are all exactly the same. And this is really like a nurture approach to, this is really a nurture approach to psychology, but it's it's p- empiricists, they're called, people that believe in the importance of the environment, that actually this is the this is the start of the nurture side. You can argue that Darwin also set the stage for the nature side of our behavior um, by looking at evolution. And we still, to this day, believe that our evolution drives our behavior quite a bit. So Darwin, Locke, and Descartes, and there's a few other, few other philosophers as well, but they're kind of setting the scene of the first, the first bullet point, if you were the first, the first, uh, the, the first firing gun of psychology. Now, are you going to get a question on that? Probably not. So, why am I telling you this? Because you need to know Descartes, John Locke, and Charles Darwin later on for when we do this idea of. Is psychology a science? So, whilst you won't need it for this bullet point, you uh, you almost definitely going to need it for uh, later bullet points, especially John Locke. Now, what we really want to look at here is this lad, right? Wilhelm Wundt, um, German, obviously, um, uh, comes from Leipzig. Leipzig. Um, what the, the the real date you need to know, and I don't want to cognitively overload you here, but the real date you need to know is 1879, 143, at the time of filming, 143 years ago. That's 2022, in case you were trying to figure that out. Um, he opened the first ever lab. Before 1879, people were looking at behavior philosophically, not psychologically. So they were like, oh, I think therefore I am. And and to be or not to be, ugh, right? To be or not to be, that's the question. Mm. Right. Wilhelm Wundt, sorry if you do philosophy, by the way. Um, Wilhelm Wundt is the first person to come along and say, park that, right? Shut up. Let's look at this scientifically. Let's let's start looking at behavior, not with all these like grand thoughts, but let's start looking at it psychologically in a lab, in a lab, uh, you know, under controlled conditions. 1879, the first psychology lab gets opened in Leipzig, Germany. That's East Germany. It's about, I think it's 70 or 100 miles away from Berlin, kind of East Germany. As a result, he is considered to be the father of psychology because he's the one who first got the ball, the ball proper rolling. Um, Descartes, Darwin, they had all these ideas, but they didn't scientifically look at them like Wundt did. Um, and there's a couple of terms you need to know about Wundt straight off the bat. So he, he wanted that the, the main thing about him is that he wanted to break complex behaviors down to their constituent parts. And what I mean by that is he didn't want to look at happiness. He didn't want to look at happiness. He wanted to look at, right, so happiness is is the complex behavior. What exactly actually is, like, what's the minutia of happiness? What's actually, you know, what are all these small things that are contributing to uh, happiness? So he didn't want to know the big complex behavior. He wanted to understand what were the small things, the small structures, the small elements of happiness that really contributed to what we see on the outside. You could argue that's like him looking at things reductionistically, and it probably is. But again, it's the first time that anybody really did this. So you do need to have a good definition of 
uh, structuralism. They can even use the one that I've just gone through, the very basic one here. But what I also did, I got a couple of ones up here. Now, I think these are these are generally a bit more complex than, than what I've just gone through. A method of interpreting an analysis of aspects, aspects of human cognition, behavior, culture and experience. Um, and this one down here, I think is quite good if you can understand this. The, the doctrine that structure is more important than function. That's what structuralism is. So I'll, I'll say that in a simpler way, I think. That's what I mean by it. So it's the doctrine, it's the concept, it's the idea that actually ha understanding happiness isn't important. Understanding what actually structures our happiness, what holds up our happiness, what contributes to our happiness, that is more important than the happiness itself. Right. So I'll say, I don't know what I'm saying it again, because it's a video, you can go back 30 seconds, but I'll try word this in a way that actually makes sense. Structuralism is the concept that uh, the, the behavior as a whole is not as important as what structures, what, like, what contributes to the behavior. That's the best one sentence uh, definition I can come up with. But you do need to know about structuralism. Um, it, it's pretty key to Wilhelm Wundt. But it's not the idea he's most actually known for. The idea he's most known for is introspection. And again, introspection basically means to look upon yourself, to look into yourself. And once again, I do actually have a good definition here. This one's a bit better. The examination or observation of one's own mental and emotional processes. Um, so I'm going to move off this now. So you might want to pause the screen in case you want to write that down, because you do definitely need to know um, introspection. So introspection is looking in on yourself. Now, again, Nobody had done this in a scientific way. No, until then, nobody had done this in a scientific way. Nobody had, and this is the important part, by the way, nobody had standardized interest, introspection across people. Descartes and Darwin and Locke, they'd asked people for their opinions and how they were feeling, but they'd never done it in such a standardized way. The same instructions to all participants in a controlled environment, they hadn't done that before. Um, so Wundt is really the first person to look at it in a scientific way. Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing, I think, for students. At the time, at the time, introspection was a highly scientific idea. It was highly scientific. Standardization in a controlled environment, fantastic, fantastic. So at the time, it was really good. The confusing bit is that our standards of scientificity have actually gone up over the last 143 years. So introspection is no longer considered scientific by today's standard. For example, remember what I said to you, if I just go on, um, scientific, scientific, uh, a science must be objective, i.e. non-opinionated. But actually, if I'm asking here for your introspection, I'm asking for your, your opinion about how you feel about something, your processes, so on and so forth. So introspection by today's standard is not actually considered a scientific idea in the slightest. Um, so this led to, to introspection and uh, structuralism led to uh, Wundt establishing what's a scientific method, right? And this scientific method is based on two things, and this is pretty, pretty key for psychology. Firstly, all behavior is seen as being caused by something. This, which you'll need to know for later on, is what we call determinism. And determinism is a very very scientific idea that your behavior is caused by something beyond your control and thus you don't have free will science does not believe in free will science does not believe that you have the choice to make your own options so behavior is being caused by something and if, if, if behavior is being caused by something and we can identify that then it should be able to predict how humans are going to behave in different conditions so that's determinism and predictability two more key ideas that i would use in your a01 by the way i would use this in your a01 without a doubt uh, for wilhelm Wundt. and this is what we call the scientific method so um 
that is pretty much all the AO1 you need to know for Vint. You need to know the... Sorry, there's a big fly going around. You need to know the year, the place, uh, introspection, structuralism, uh, scientific method, including determinism and uh, predictability. But you also need to be able to evaluate it. I'm not sure these evaluations are particularly great, to be honest. Let me just read through a couple to see, because I, I am going to redo these slides a little bit, because they're, they're not particularly uh, strong in terms of evaluation. Um, uh, one, this one's quite uh, big. Much of the subject matter in psychology is unobservable, uh, therefore you can't do it. So you need you need subjective measurements. You need subjective measurements in uh, looking at human behaviour. The other the other evaluation I would use personally is that whilst Vun advanced whilst whilst Vun advanced uh, psychology as a science very well, his methods are no longer scientific. Um, so therefore, maybe he's, his methods have lost temporal validity, maybe, because uh, they're no longer applicable to today's society. Um, so uh, there's a little bit, well, I mean, there's a little bit more on introspection there. Not really sure why that's there and not later on, but it might be worth just flicking through that to see if there's anything else there. A um, couple of examples. Um, but um, that, as far as I was aware, was pretty much it. In terms of, sorry, in terms of this question just here, so I've got this just to show you what kind of detail you would need to do. Um, describe Vrindt's role in the development of psychology. Just consider what things. Would you be able to write about eight different, I would, I would argue eight different things there. To get six marks, you need eight different ticks. So if I scroll down to the mark scheme, just have a think about, oh, I think they've spelt Leipzig wrong. That's embarrassing. Um, <clears throat> it's L E I, except after P. No, nope, that's not it. Um, Vint is the father of psychology. You know, uh, set up in Leipzig, eighteen seventy nine. You got introspection on there, defining what introspection is. You got structuralism, defining what structuralism is. Um, and then his have a look here. His work paved the way for later controlled research and the study of mental processes. I e, you could argue that uh, Vint birthed cognitive psychology well, there's a lot of birthing analogies in this video um Vunt got his legs in the stirrups and but and birthed cognitive psychology himself um and it all came from him so uh, he is the father of not just psychology but particularly cognitive psychology because getting you to think about your thought processes um, that is pretty much it. Please do not forget about this bullet point. Um, it often is forgotten. Uh, but like I say, just because it doesn't have a bullet point on the spec, it does not mean that it's actually going to come up. So that's something for you to be aware of. See you later.